Hello and welcome to Inside Music, episode number 137. I'm your host, James Shotwell. It's great to be with you again. My guest this episode is the great Connor Skelly. He's the founder of Beyond the Music, a nonprofit organization based in Chicago, but today he's here to talk about something that I know is near and dear to many of the listeners on this show. Connor has done the impossible. Well, not the impossible, the unthinkable. Not the unthinkable. He's done that thing that we all dream about doing, but so many of us never get up the nerve to do, and that is he quit his job. Yes, Connor stuck his middle finger up to the corporate world and said, I'm going to go do it myself. I know some of you have already looked at the title of this episode, and you probably thought, DIY. We're going to discuss artists doing it without a label, but that's not what we're here to discuss. Connor is a music professional who decided to step outside the corporate world and go into business on his own. He's putting all of his trust, all of his hope, all of his aspirations behind himself because he believes in himself and he believes in what he wants to do in this life. Connor has a big history working in music, but right now he's doing a little bit of everything as a digital consultant. He just left his job a couple of weeks ago and already has his first three clients, a goal that he actually didn't think he would achieve until sometime in January. In fact, when we recorded this episode, I had to let Connor go because a fourth potential client was calling him to hopefully secure their deal. Connor is going to tell us about what it took to finally walk away from his job, his new role, and the challenges that you face. Because I think, even if you don't want to do what Connor is doing right now, the challenges that one faces in trying to go into business for themselves are largely the same. You got to pick a name, you have to know how to price yourself, you know how to not oversell yourself, but also how to not undersell yourself. You also have to just have an idea, or I should say an open mind about what the marketplace is like. You might want to be a music professional who helps bands get ahead through digital consulting and digital strategy, but in reality, if you have those skills, they can be applied to many industries. You can help banks, you can help coffee shops, you can help movie theaters. The fact is being open-minded to the possibilities and the limitless potential that you possess. I think we all like to believe that we believe in ourselves, but Connor is somebody who's actually putting his money and his livelihood where his mouth is, and today he's going to tell us how we can all learn a little bit from him. Second, Connor is also going to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is music conferences. Not long ago, there were three major conferences in America. There was CMJ in New York City, South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, and then Launch Music Conference in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Now, there are others, and you might have heard of some of them. You may have even attended some of them. But these days, there's only South by Southwest and Launch. Then you have some smaller ones like Millennium Music Conference, another conference based out of Pennsylvania. There's Ultra Music Weekend, which is in Miami, which is kind of a music festival meets conference, but it's invitation only. The point being... There's not a lot of music conferences for everybody else. If you live in one of the big cities, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, I guess Miami or in Austin, Texas, then there's probably an event there for you. However, these days, the music industry is everywhere. And even in the town where you live, where you're listening to this right now, you're probably not the only person who's thought about working in the music business. They could be recording engineers, artists, production designers, publicists, managers, music writers, anything that you can think of that could be a career in music, there's probably somebody in your area who wants to do that thing. The problem is there's not a lot of opportunities to, one, meet other people who think about these things and want to do these things, and two, not a lot of ways to learn about it unless you spend a lot of time online listening to things like this podcast or reading holixdaily.com or Music Business Worldwide or Digital Music News or Hypebot or any one of thousands of resources. Connor and I think that that's kind of stupid. Just like everyone is afraid to go into business for themselves, even though they really want to, I think that there are a lot of people who believe they could have a music conference in their area, they just don't know how to get started. Connor was just like that. Two years ago, he probably would have told you he he wanted to have a conference but had no idea how to get started. But earlier this year, I actually attended a conference in Chicago that Connor put together as a debut event for his nonprofit, Beyond the Music. We hosted a live Inside Music podcast there where we talked about what it's like to sell merch on tour with a few of my favorite people in the industry, including recent guest Allison Lanza. On this episode, Connor's going to tell us how that event came together, but more importantly, he gives us some practical advice to getting started ourselves. I'm taking this to heart. I'm actually trying to start a music conference right here in West Michigan where I live, in Grand Rapids to be specific. And Connor's helping me do that. We're building the idea together. But on this episode, we talk a little bit about the general challenges people face, how to overcome them, and how to prevent yourself from stalling out. Because let me give you a real world example. 
I'm trying to start a conference in Michigan right now and I've emailed a ton of potential venues. I've explained what I want to do. I've told them how much time it's going to take. I've told them how many people I expect to have there, but none of them have confirmed the date and time yet. I cannot seem to find a venue and there's a part of me that already wants to give up because if I don't have a venue, it's really hard to book everything else because you want to make sure that that, that cornerstone of planning is done. But as Connor explains in this conversation, there's still plenty of things I can do, tangential things like programming and you know potential people to speak and marketing ideas that I can keep generating while I'm waiting on those bigger pieces to fall into place. We're going to talk about all these things and much more over the course of the next 30 minutes. But before we get there, I need to tell you a couple of quick things. First, this episode of Inside Music and every episode of Inside Music is brought to you by Holix, the music industry's leading digital promotional distribution company. Now, what that means is that Holix works with record labels, publicists, and independent artists from all over the world to share new and pre-release music without fear of piracy. To learn how they do this and gain access to a free 30-day trial, visit holix.com. That's H A U. L-I-X.com. All you have to do is visit the website and sign up today and your first month of service will be 100% free. Quit before the month's over and you never have to pay anything. But this is your opportunity to promote your music the same way artists like Metallica, Chance the Rapper, Blink-182, and thousands of other notable names have gotten their music out into the influencers that shape the industry today. Second, Inside Music is now on YouTube. If you go there and you search Inside Music Podcast, you can find all 137 episodes of the show uploaded for your listening pleasure. You can listen to the time we had Knocked Loose on the show, or Real Friends, or the time that we talked about how I got started in the industry and somebody interviewed me. It's all out there, and it's all 100% free. So next time you're at work, go ahead and put it on in the background and just let those episodes stream, because every play helps us get the show out there to more and more people. It helps us attract bigger talent, and overall, it makes a better community for everyone. So please, head to YouTube and check out Inside Music. Catch up. Go to the archives. Dig through it all. Finally, I would really like to ask that you follow the show on Twitter or follow Holix. It's at Holix, H-A-U-L-I-X, and the show is Inside Music Pod or Inside Music P-O-D. Follow us for updates on upcoming guests, news about our recent guests, and a lot more information related to life in the music business. You can also reach out to me on Twitter. It's at James D. Shotwell. My name is spelled just like it sounds, Shotwell. Anyways, I'm going to get to the conversation with Connor. Usually, I would plug some song here or tell you about the music that's going to play, but I'm going to be honest with you. After we started putting all the episodes of Inside Music onto YouTube, we hit a huge problem. It's really hard to monetize videos when you're using songs that you don't own the copyrights for. And as you know, we've had a lot of artists on the show who suggest songs for us to use, and that's awesome. But getting the artist to tell us to use a song and getting the people who own the copyright to that song to let us make money off of it are two entirely different things. And it's not all about money, but it is about creating the most content possible and getting the funding that YouTube gives us helps make that a thing that we can do. So we're going to play some free music given to us from the YouTube music library, and then we're going to get to the conversation with Connor. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the show. So what are you up to today? Um, a lot, actually. Today's a particularly busy day for me. Um, I got a few networking calls, um, a meeting downtown, um, and a, uh, a networking kind of event tonight, um, and just a bunch of like client work and stuff. So back to back, starting starting in like 35 minutes. Well, I'm glad that you could fit this in. Yeah, you you caught you caught me uh, you caught me early, which is good. Well, I've learned that if I want to do a podcast with somebody that doesn't do like a ton of podcasts or interviews, if I just am like, "Hey, can we hop on the phone later?" They say yes, and then I kind of pounce it on them. They're more likely to agree because if I'm like, "Hey, I want to get you on the podcast," people will be like, "Eh, it, I don't know why." People get real weird about it, but if I kind of spring it on them. It tends to work out more in my favor. And you're always game anyways, but it, it worked out. Yeah, yeah. I'm, all, I'm always down for it, but uh, I like that tactic. I'll have to remember that. 
I have friends that work in music that have never been on the show and they just keep stringing me along. I have been like, the show's been around for like three years and they're like, yeah, we'll get to it. And I'm like, what? We spend time together every week. It's the exact same thing, except I hit record. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So next time, next time you hang with them, you know, just have, have your phone in your, in your lap and just record it and then tell them afterward. Well, okay. Okay. I recorded this. Yeah, I've tried that one. Um, I've tried to get my buddy Ben Howell, a photographer here in the industry, to be on the show several times. And we were in the, we were on a long car ride once. We drove out to Denver from Michigan, which is like 16 hours. And I was like, this would be the perfect opportunity to record a podcast together. And he was like, I'm not really feeling it, blah, 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 blah. And then after a little while, he rolled down his window, so it got real loud in the car. And then he like really opened up to me about like his career and life and stuff. And then <laughs> when he was done, he rolled the window back up, and I was like, I see what you're doing. Like he was, he knew. Yeah, uh, he was thinking he was he was already ahead of me. So, you know. Uh, so I want to. I know you don't have a ton of time, but I do want to. I want to touch on two things with you. It's kind of a twofold do-it-yourself episode of the show. So first and foremost, let's go back to what you just mentioned. Your new kind of role and career that you're kind of developing for yourself. You recently took the plunge that everybody, I guess, kind of dreams of doing, which is you kind of you know threw up your finger to the corporate world and decided to strike it out <laughs> on your own. So first, let's start there. So tell, I know you've already told me, but like tell the people listening like what what you did and why you did it and what you're doing now. Yeah, so I, I, I was very fortunate, you know, even before I graduated college to have, to get offered an internship with a big company. And I worked there for two years and it was honestly, like I couldn't have imagined a better entrance into the professional world. I got such a wide range of experience and the boss that I had at the time was great. Um, and he gave me a lot of visibility to, you know, big, like big boy business stuff, like, you know, working with people from up top. Um, but then after, you know, I worked there for two years and I worked for this other company and it was just like, I'm sitting in this place for like eight hours, nine hours a day. And I just, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> um, you know, and for some people, like they love it. They love the consistency. They love, they love that. Um, but it just, it prevented me from working on a lot of the stuff that I want to work on and playing around in different industries and working with different kinds of people. So uh, I had the idea for a few months and I was like, well, let me just see if I can, cause I'm, you know, I did want to leave, but I still wanted to kind of build some sort of infrastructure before I left. Um, so I wouldn't be completely broke and uh, scrambling terribly. Um, but yeah, I made the, I made the jump and I've been, I have three clients right now doing uh, marketing consulting, doing a wide range of things for them. They're in all different industries and uh, it's been really fun. I mean, it, it's been great to just kind of, make up my own schedule. Um, I know that can be kind of daunting for people because then they'll get caught in laziness, but there's really nothing like, uh, there's no motivation like survival, you know, and having to, you know, wake up and like, well, I won't, I won't get paid if I don't do anything, you know, so that's, that's a really good motivator. And ultimately, what do you hope do you hope to build this into like a full time job? I mean, obviously, you need to pay your bills, but like, is the goal to kind of become full time yourself and then build your own firm underneath you, or do you just want to be a lone wolf out there in the social strategy landscape? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've, I'm definitely playing around with both with both ideas in my head, um, and. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for right now, because I'm so new to it, it's just a, a really, I'm just kind of focusing on the learning process and like learning what works, really listening to clients and like kind of not only understanding their needs and how I can translate it, you know, from a consulting perspective, but also like really paying attention to client dynamics and what I like, what I don't like, what I can improve. And then over time, you know, as I, I'd like to kind of get five, maybe seven clients at one time to really understand, to really like push myself, um, doing, doing this kind of work on my own. And if I really like it, and I mean, I know plenty of people that, that work in the space and that are my age and kind of want to make that leap. You know, if, if I'm able to, if I get to the point where I have so many clients that I would love to just offload some work to them 
and kind of create this sort of de facto firm, um, you know, I'd be open to that. Uh, but right now, it's just kind of it's just a learning process. Absolutely. Do you have? I guess I don't want to ask. I want to ask for advice, but I want to do it in like a in a more progressive way. So let me ask you this: in terms of getting that first client or that first couple of clients, what did you find was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome? So the the first client that I had, I had met him through a uh, CEO of this company. I had met him through a, one of my close friends. Um, this close friend of mine, he was an intern there like five, six years ago. And he would just tell me about them, about this company. And then it wasn't for like, maybe two years or something until I had met him and um, you know, we got to talk about marketing and his business and we kind of liked the ideas that I had. So then I built a relationship with, with, uh, with him from there. But then it wasn't even until a year after that, that we met again and we started talking more marketing stuff and kind of how, how I think he should maybe change things up to help his business. And then he left my ideas. So then he just kind of brought me on. Um, and so like, that's where that started. Um, it was just basically just pure networking and just identifying the opportunity when I saw it. And then the other client, so I had, I left my last company with two clients and the other client I met at my previous company. And um, it was his partner had a, had a company in Chicago and they needed a new website. And so I was, um, I was kind of tasked to help them redesign this website, do some marketing campaigns and some other like long-term stuff down the road. Was it hard to figure out a rate for your work? Like I know like a lot of people struggle with like, what is the value of what I bring to the table? Like how did you kind of, I guess, figure that one out? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a million ways to go about it. Right. So like, I mean, I, I started off at a lower, well, I guess it's difficult because like if you want to say like and this isn't this isn't really true for me but like if if you're a consultant and you're starting out and you're like all right i want to charge people a hundred dollars an hour like okay fine but you have one client and they're paying you forty dollars an hour then you can't tell people that you get paid a hundred dollars an hour like you get paid forty dollars an hour right so it's it, there's a balance in being realistic with what, with your experience in the market and the opportunities that you have. So, well, while also not compromising your work. So one way you can go about doing it is, and I've done kind of a variety of these things depending on the client and it is always kind of depending on the client and their needs and their budget and all that is uh, I would maybe start at a lower hourly rate set the expectation that yes, this is typically lower, uh, but kind of prove yourself in six weeks, eight weeks or whatever. Um, and then keep that conversation going to bump it up from there. Another thing you could do is like project-based. So like if a company wants one marketing asset or one thing, charge them like a flat rate. Uh, it's important to kind of get if it's like a, a larger project, get, you know, a 50% deposit up front. That's always super helpful. And, um, you know, you can kind of get that flat rate. Ultimately, the goal is to kind of get into a monthly retainer with clients. And if there are specialty projects there, you can do a flat rate or an hourly rate on top of that. Um, but right now, I'm just kind of in the phase where it's like I'm taking in whatever I can. And, I'm, I mean, I'm even looking for people, if they're, like, curious and they're just like, Hey, I want you to spend five hours just kind of looking at my stuff. Like I can't really pay you, um, but I'd like to kind of see what your thoughts are, and we can go from there. I mean, five hours or three hours or whatever isn't gonna, you know, be a detriment to to anyone really. I mean, if you're offering that value upfront. So, I mean, there's a there's a long long winded way of saying like there's a million ways to go about doing it. Um, it's just kind of like what what's the best way that you can offer value to people without you know putting yourself into the ground i lose you on that one oh i'm absolutely here man uh sorry about that sometimes i forget to unmute my microphone but that was really great advice i know i can yeah, yeah it's... go ahead <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i mean i i just i just spoken to someone recently on uh you know they're they've been doing their own consulting thing for a while and um 
just kind of getting a lot of, got a lot of good feedback on you know ex, like not compromising in your pricing um but you know be be willing to negotiate a bit more um let let the client deny you don't i think the biggest takeaway that i have was put out what you want to put out you know offer what what you think is good and where you can cover yourself and let the client say no don't say no for yourself beforehand don't be like oh they can't afford that or oh i'm charging too much like let them say no because what could also happen is that you you can underprice yourself out of work because it's kind of a, a a thing that happens in the back of our head where it's like oh if i'm doing a website and one person's charging seven hundred dollars and another person is charging ten thousand dollars well that's a huge range but i'm going to assume that the person doing seven hundred dollars isn't going to do that great of a job compared to the ten thousand dollar person so i could probably bring that ten thousand dollar person down uh as opposed to taking the underpriced work so which is something that like i didn't really think about like kind of underpricing yourself out of, out of the job um is is something that apparently just kind of it's pretty common for for people doing their own thing. It's funny you say that because as you were describing it, I I never think to, to look at things that way. I had an opportunity earlier this year where I was approached by one of these rappers that have a liquor company, and they wanted me to write. Um, <clears throat> they had a project in development where they're going to have like a short novella and they had paid somebody to write it, but they didn't like it. So they wanted to, they fired that writer and was going to hire a new writer to come on and do the project. And when we were talking mm -hmm. about it, they came to me and they were like, how much would you charge to do this? And there was no, like, this is what we paid the other guy, or this is that. And my yeah. head, you know, I, I tend to look at things like that as what's the lowest amount of money I'm willing to take. I never think to go too high because my biggest fear is being like, Oh, I will charge X, and then they immediately are like, "Never mind." You know what I mean? And I never yeah. really, I never really think to look at it from the opposite end, where it's like, "Well, the price you give it also reflects value," or you know, like Walmart versus Target kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, and it's like I also learned that, like the value of tier pricing too. So if if that rapper was like, you know, what do you charge? And you were like, you know, I charge like I will offer you this you know, minimum viable product for the lowest amount that you're willing to take, like, or I can do the minimum viable product plus this service or plus this additional thing for this price. And I mean, you can do as many tiers as you want, but cause then it's like, then the, the ball is fully in their court where it's like, now, you know, you have all the cards out on the table, you're being as transparent as you can. And then, then you can negotiate from there if you need to. Absolutely. I don't know. I mean, there's nothing worse in the world to me than suggesting how much I'm willing to do something for and what, fearing that it might be too much. And the person that responds like within a minute being like, oh, yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Because that tells you that right. on there and they were like, holy shit. Like, yeah, say yes. You know what I mean? Or that – Yeah. And, and kind of how that project ran out, I can't talk about it too much, but it did kind of become a thing where I was like, oh, I think they might have said yes because they realized that they had to scrap it it wouldn't be a big loss. You know what I mean? Like you got to make sure that they see the value of the thing that you're going to make for them so that they want to keep it around. Cause if they feel like, well, we could just write it off as being like a loss or whatever, then, you know, you kind of lower your chances of getting that thing you're doing out into the world regardless. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and every, every client's different, every industry is different. Like the way, even if, even if you and I were doing the same exact project, but I was doing it for the finance industry and you're doing it for music like that, that budget alone is going to be way different. And that's, that's only one variable. So, you know, it's, it's trial and error. It's kind of remembering what the scenario was and how you went about it. And then if it happens again, you know, what, what could you do better? I totally understand what you're saying. And I appreciate you shedding light on that. Cause I do think that, you know, I think the dream, as we said earlier, is to kind of, Go into business for yourself and be your own person. And you know, anyone that watches a Gary V video or somebody who thinks they're Gary V hears that same thing where he's like, "Don't watch Netflix. Start your own business at home." But I think the hardest part, aside from getting clients, is the idea of like, "Well, what are my services worth?" Especially when you're first starting out, because you're not established, and so you want to be like, "Well, I want to give people a deal." 
but I also need to think about how much time. And, and personally, I'm a guy who just wants to do stuff. Like, I, I like I, if I have an idea, like the thing we're going to talk about in a second, I don't look at it as I want to do this. How much money can I make from it? I'm like, I want to do this, so let's let's do this thing. And my brain doesn't yeah. necessarily go towards profit. Yeah, I'm exactly the same way. It's like, um, you know, like tying it tying it back to like the client stuff. It's like if I'm if I get some interest from someone, I'm like, let's have a 30 minute conversation so I can learn like learn about business, learn what's worked well, what hasn't, what you're willing to try out, and let's just be with. You know, if I, like I'm not gonna be like, hey, pay me pay me a billion dollars up front. Um, or I'll do this one thing for you and then you're going to bankrupt your company. It's like, I just want to like, let's just go in and do it. And, and some people don't operate that way. Some people want to have that, you know, stability up front or that assurance up front. Um, but for me, it's just like, and it sounds like for you too, so let's just, let's get that value out there. And you know, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, that's a learning point And that's something that you can teach people on too. Absolutely. And, and and part of it, th me thinks that it's like the music industry mindset of like, well, I have to offer to do it for free or cheap as possible or else they won't let me do it. But the problem is, is then one day you're like, oh, I'm like over 30 and I have bills. Like I have to, right. I, I have to be making money. And I think that that's like, just to bring it back to music, I think that that's what ends up breaking a lot of people in the music industry that maybe at 21, 22, 23 are like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it, whatever it takes, whatever. And then by the time you get to 30, like the rest of your life is starting to become established and you have to be like, you have to take into account, you know, what life costs and like what kind of life you wish to have. And sometimes, you know, finding enough of an argument to justify people spending more money on the thing that you want to do in this industry specifically is a, it's, it's a hill that a lot of people seem to not get over, you know? Yeah. It's tough. I mean, it's, I think a lot of it, it's a culture issue, you know, like there's just a big, you know, I'm just going to talk to the United States here. I mean, it, there's a huge stigma just around art in general, you know, people don't want to pay for it because it's all up there. You know, this like, um, this whole, I mean, it's been happening for decades. I mean, it's happened probably for, I don't know, art history, but like, uh, it's just it's this whole stigma around like, well, if you put something out on the internet, I'm not going to pay for it because it's out there. Like, no, like this is something that people worked on and took time for. And if you want something similar, then you should pay for that time, you know? And, and I never understood the argument where it was like, if someone asks an artist for say like, I don't know, if they want like a poster and they're like, okay, it's going to be this amount. And they're like, oh, I would never pay that. But I like your style. It's like, okay, well, if you want my style, then you got to pay for it. You know, so it, you're right. Like music is really tough and it's having to balance like integrity of your work with also recognizing dynamics in the, of the industry and kind of the way that I would maybe mitigate that whole thing is that there's just like so much opportunity to go in a million different directions in the music industry where like you could, you know, you don't have to just do stuff for artists, right? Like you can do something for a studio or you can do something for a label. Um, or do something for like even a content creator that's related to music. So there's there's just a, there's just a lot. Absolutely. Now I only have you for like ten more minutes, so we have to move fast and get to our next topic. Yeah, that's it. All right. So with this in mind, something that you and I have been talking about behind the scenes that I'm just I, I, I believe in the idea that if you put it into the world, then it has a better chance of actually coming together. So if we say we're going to do something or that yep. we're working on something, we're going to actualize it right now, and uh, we're going to practice that. Yeah. So. I've been trying to get Connor to help me develop a music business, a music industry conference of sorts for West Michigan, Michigan in, as a whole, but specifically West Michigan. Uh, Grand Rapids is kind of considered a B or C level market, which for those new to the industry or outside the industry basically means that if Katy Perry goes on tour, she's going to play Detroit and Chicago. But if she goes on tour long enough and she does all the big cities and the next time around, she's going to play Grand Rapids. For a good example of this, last year, Justin Timberlake did a big nationwide tour. He probably played in an arena near you. And this year, uh -huh. he just announced he's going to do a day 
play in Grand Rapids. So like the, the second leg of the tour tends to come to Grand Rapids. So it's a, it's a thriving, rising city. And Connor has a history of putting on music conferences and events and networking and getting people to give a shit about other people who might not know that much but want to build something together. And so with all this in mind, this idea of doing it yourself and not, you know, not getting yourself down because you don't know what you're doing and stuff, I want to kind of use the next couple of minutes to inspire other people to hopefully do the same because I'd like to see a fresh wave of conferences because there's a few that are kind of pillars of the industry. You have Launch Music Conference, you have South by Southwest, there used to be a CMJ in New York City, but there's a whole bunch of states filled with a whole bunch of dreamers that don't have a big gathering point. So Connor, if someone wants to put on a music event, give me like a very brief synopsis of like what you would tell them to encourage them to give it a shot. Well, first, like, what do you want to accomplish? Like, if you want, what do you want to accomplish and who do you want to target? So if you want let me just put an example of what I've done. So like the, the industry workshop that I did for Beyond the Music last May, I wanted to um, show anyone that was interested. And again, that's not a specific audience. I would have, next time around, I want to get more specific and build out actual personas of people that would be interested. Um, for people that are interested, maybe students in high school or college or people even just starting out in the music industry, giving them visibility to people that work behind the scenes and James, you were kind enough to attend and speak at it. Um, and so have these people like my goal for it was I want to educate. Okay. Now another a goal could be, I wanted to entertain. I wanted to, I don't know, like provide like just facilitate some sort of dialogue or conversation. And, um, that's kind of where I would start with like, what, what do you want to accomplish with this? And then who are the people that you're going to target and then figure out how are you going to go about doing it? Um, you know, doing it with like programming of like different workshops and stuff. So having something like, you know, how to, um, how to create an elevator pitch for yourself, the music industry or do stuff for like photography or like community building. Um, you know, have, create programming around that and then, you know, do tactical things like what's the date, what's the venue, what date works for the venue, um, you need tables, you need chairs, lighting, all that type of stuff. Ticket sales, how much your ticket's going to be, ticket tiers, there's a, there's a million things. And my big thing right now is not getting hung up on stuff that's not getting done. I, uh, I'm i trying to get this one in Michigan going, and I sent out a bunch of emails to venues, and then I kind of hit this roadblock of like, well, I haven't gotten a, no, I haven't gotten any further because I'm waiting on somebody else. So when you hit those hurdles, when you hit that, that wall of like, I'm going to go A, B, C, D, if you hit a wall at A, what uh, is it? how do we move on while waiting on those people? I mean, obviously, because I, I feel like if I just stall out right now, it's completely possible. So do you yeah. think as an organizer that it's good to, I guess, start thinking about some of the more tangential things? Like maybe I don't have a venue yet, but it's good to think about, you know, what, what, kind, of, what kind of things do we want to discuss or who might be invited or like how do I build without when I don't have some of those big pieces in place yet? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I did this exact thing. Um, this is going to sound like super nerdy and very businessy, uh, but it's one of the few things that I learned from this, from one, I forget the name of the class, but the cl a class that I took at, uh, in college where I, for the industry workshop, created a Gantt chart, G-A-N-T-T, -T, and it's sort of like a waterfall approach to project management where like, you know, like you said, like A, then B, then C, but it's where A and B can overlap or A and D can overlap or any combination of those things. So it's like, um, it's a timeline and it's all the tasks that you need to accomplish. And then you can better map out what can be, what needs to be done when, and then like when you can do things over other things, especially like while you're waiting for other stuff to get done, what else can you accomplish? It's a really good way to kind of visualize that. And I should actually, James, I should send you the one that I had for the workshop just to so get an idea of what I'm thinking about. After a while, I kind of stopped touching it once, once the thing was moving and I had all the pieces in place. But uh, it was super helpful for, for me to you know, launch my first event. 
Absolutely, and I would appreciate that. And uh, we can mm-hmm. probably run something similar on on the Holix Daily blog, holixdaily.com, in the weeks ahead, just to give anyone else a primer as we head into the new year. That would make a great blog update. Anyways, uh, before I get going, I do want to ask you this in regards to people who are thinking about conferences. And I know that you know you said have a specific goal, and I think that having a goal is really good. But for you, when people are thinking about the person coming to the event, what do you think? is the thing that attracts people the most is it having those big name speakers is it you know is it you know the cost what is what do you think is have you found to be like the biggest motivating factor in getting people to participate in especially new events that maybe don't have a history or any kind of authority quite yet um for ones that don't really have authority i think a a big driver would be getting like if you're somehow you know through your network or whatever maybe through you know shelling out um, some extra money to get a big speaker um, that would get some attention. But I think what's most impactful, regardless of the, if you're, if it's your first event or your thousandth event is that what is the value that you're offering to people? Cause at the end of the day, like people are going to look out for themselves. That's just, that's just how humans roll. So like why, if I am, Like if I am a high school senior and I really love music and I love, you know, reading all music industry news and all that type of stuff. And I want to learn more about it. Like what do I, how, how am I going to benefit from this event? And so putting yourself into that world and being like, all right, here's, here's the programming we're going to create. Here are the one to five workshops that we're going to create for that person. So then they can come out of this thing, either like, I don't like the music industry at all, which is still valuable, right? Um, They don't like it at all. They have a million more questions, which is also great, or it could, and, or it could be a sign of bad programming. Um, Or they're like, yes, this is amazing. This was perfect. I want to learn more. I want to network. I want to, you know, continue this path that I'm on. So those are like three really large buckets, but it's like, like what's the best way that you can offer value to people perfect now before i let you go because i know you have to get going can you give us all your plugs and your new company and let people come to you when they need you yeah um so right now i'm like really hot on the idea of answering any any questions that people may have around marketing or branding or content or whatever um so you reach out to me um on twitter it's at Connor underscore Skelly underscore. All the other good ones were taken. Um, I may even start doing this thing where I could schedule five minutes of conversations with people just to kind of have them ask me anything that they want around this type of stuff. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, feel free to check out my music industry organization, Beyond the Music, at underscore Beyond the Music on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook if you want to search that too. Well, thank you so much for being here, Connor. I know I have to let you go. Usually, at this point in the show, I would say, what song do you want with this episode? But because we're now on YouTube, I can't say that anymore because I had to file 96 Uh, copyright infringement, uh, whatever it is, petitions to become monetized. So we have to use YouTube music. But I appreciate you being here. I'll pick something that's hopefully interesting. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch soon. Maybe we can do a follow-up as this conference moves along and we'll just keep plugging it disguised as episodes of the show. Yeah, let's uh, let's keep updating people on, on the process of it. That's a great idea, man. All right, man. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a good day with the rest of your calls. All right, you too, James. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon, man. Bye.